All right. Good morning, Alter Realty Group agents. This is Kevin Lauren. I'm the training uh, director of training and marketing, of course. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we do have a few new recruits on the line, so welcome, new recruits. Hopefully, you guys find uh, this in an informative inf uh, webinar. Uh, today is today's agenda is as follows. We're going to be going through real quick. There's been a couple of different uh, little updates to agent marketing and the property websites. So I just wanna go through that super quick. And then I also wanna show you guys how to add Google Analytics to your, uh, to your agent marketing site as well. So those are the two things that I'm gonna be going through. And then Travis Breton will be going through a really good presentation on our duty to inspect. So uh, before that, let's have Bill Sites join us. Uh, Bill, good morning, can you hear us? Good morning, Kevin. All right, how are we doing today? We are ready for an absolute scorching hot day. I know, it's a, it's a warm one here in California, absolutely. I'm, I'm not one to complain about uh, living near the ocean, but I'll tell you what, when you don't have AC and it's 100, it's brutal. <laughs> I hear you, I know, we're not, uh, the coastal people are usually not so geared for the heat as people that live inland. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's about two or three weeks a year that just, you wish yeah. you had it. Uh, we're in one of those weeks. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet. Um, so Bill, uh, Ben, Bill Seitz, of course, is our director of Clearview Mortgage. And so Bill typically likes to give us a little update on things that are happening in the mortgage world. So Bill, what's happening today? Yeah, uh, not, not a huge update as far as things today. Uh, Marcus, uh, once again, the stock market is, um, is really rebounding nicely. So those of you who, are invested in equities and didn't panic and sell. Uh, you guys are probably a little more comfortable right now, uh, despite all the unbelievable events of the past few months. Um, thank goodness uh, the market has come back nicely. Uh, number two, quickly, uh, conventional loans. They had, when we were kind of in the in the the heart of this, you know, pandemic, whatever we want to call it. Um, they had dropped the FICO requirements down to uh, 640, I'm sorry, 660 for purchase. Um, I brought them up, I'm sorry. And now they've brought them back down to 640. So it's a little bit of a benefit there. So if you, if you have a client that wants to go conventional, um, maybe they have a 645, 650 mid FICO and before they couldn't go conventional, um, they can go conventional now. Uh, and on cash out, it's, it's minimum 660. So a little bit of, of relief there and some of these overlays and some of these rules that they had brought, they had, you know, brought in during the uncertainty of the uh, economy and the jobs, uh, which seem to be re rebounding pretty good. So uh, and I think we'll continue to see that through the end of the year, as long as we don't have anything, <laughs> no more, uh, <laughs> no more. Black swans, uh, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we'll be praying for that. But anyways. That's just a little bit of good news on the conventional side because a lot of people don't want to go into an FHA loan if they don't, you know, if they don't need to. Absolutely. And that's that. That's it for today. Okay. <laughs> All right, perfect, Bill. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Yep. So uh, the one thing I wanted to go through really quick is just on on our uh, agent marketing property websites. They, there's this new kind of property site builder beta, and really all this does is just helps us uh, set up our global settings. So, you know, if you want every time you want your uh, property websites, um, when, when, you know, they, they, uh, they read the MLS and they create the property websites on their own, you want them to have, you know, a certain layout. So you can pick which layout that you want them to default to. You can pick which domain uh, extension you like best for yours. And then you can also, you know, basically put in a, a profile title. Um, and you can even have like a little... Uh, you know, cookie cutter disclaimer at the bottom of your website. So a um, couple different things there. And then also you can, you know, uh, select which way you want the gallery. So you can do, you know, grid, masonry, slider, vertical. Um, and you can also, um, you know, enable the open house pages globally. Um, lead templates, same thing. You can kind of, you know, go through and select all this stuff, save changes. So it just makes it really nice. Um, I mean, the, this, as all of you, who have been using this system for you know the last several months? They just they always are adding things. They're always getting better. So just you know I, I've been continually impressed by the agent marketing system. Um, 
just so you guys can see an example of one of these agent marketing websites. They are beautiful. They come stocked with tours and maps, <clears throat> all the different you know views that you like, and brochures are already ready to go. So very, very cool stuff. And now, as I said, we're able to you know globally uh, set up all the different um, settings and so forth. So the other thing I wanted to show you guys is we do have, you know, these, um, these websites and, you know, the, the whole agent marketing system does have a pretty darn good uh, tracking system and, and hit tracking. But if you want to take this to the next level and you want to have some really good stats on traffic to your website, we can actually add, um, we can, you know, create a Google Analytics account like this, and you can add that to your websites. So I'll show you what that means. Um, we'll go into our personal websites and go into options. And we can, I believe it is, it's one of these. But we can add our uh, our Google Analytics <coughs> uh, code into this, and then we can go ahead and we can read Google Analytics. Now, Google Analytics goes into a lot more detail than obviously just our little, you know, hit counter. So you can get all kinds of really cool uh, stats on acquisition, on the audience that is coming to your website how they're getting to your website, the behavior once they get to your website. So you can really break this stuff down. And I think it's really fun. I analyze this stuff all the time. This is for our corporate website. And so, you know, I, I definitely encourage you guys to add Google Analytics to your websites as well. Um, not hey, a Kevin. requirement. Yes, sir. Um, is that something that all agents should do to, that have a website just to see how it's performing, what that data, I mean, is telling them? You know, it's not a requirement, Bill, but I'm the kind of person that likes to understand um, traffic and I like to understand, you know, how people are getting to my website because that allows me to tweak my marketing. And if I know certain demographics of people are coming to my website, well, I can, I can kind of tweak what I'm doing, right? That makes sense. So I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, realtors are busy. There's a lot going on. So I don't want to add something that is just, you know, not something that they're, they're going to really benefit from. Or, and, and as you can see, you know, there's a lot to Google Analytics. You know, behaviors, acquisition, audience. Um, they even have real-time stats. So, you know, it's a cool thing to be able to, to monitor, but I don't want to, to pull agents' focus too far away from what they really need to be doing, which is selling. <laughs> right? So um, I encourage you guys to do that. If you, if you need some help, just go ahead and, and schedule an appointment with me and we can go through that. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Travis Breton, our corporate broker, on the line. And I'm going to pull up Travis's slides. Good morning, Travis. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? Very good. All right. Let me grab your stuff. Um, thank you for, for sending this stuff over, Travis. Much appreciated. Yeah, no problem. All right, I will share this stuff with you guys as well. Okay, so Travis is going to go over the duty to inspect, which is obviously a, a very important part of what we do. So Travis, go ahead. So as you guessed it, this is probably, you know, or this is pertaining to um, visual inspections. Uh, we're going to be going over kind of the AVID a little bit, when we have to do it, when we don't have to do it. And, why we have to do it really. <laughs> so um, go ahead and go to the next slide. You got it. So introduction. So I, I took these slides off of um, uh, car information. I put it into a slide form just so we can kind of get through it in a um, organized fashion. So if it's a little dry, sorry, but it is very informative. Uh, law requires that all real estate licensees who deal with residential property containing one to four Dwelling units must conduct a reasonably competent and diligent visual inspection and to disclose to a prospective purchaser any facts that affect the value or desirability of the property that such an investigation would reveal. 
So this is actually a civil code. So what types of properties are covered under uh, this law? This law covers residential real property with one to four units um, and personal property manufactured homes, including mobile homes. This includes transactions even when exempt from TDS, such as probate or REO. Visual inspection is not required on commercial, vacant land, or five plus residential. A licensee does not have a statutory duty to conduct a visual inspection on residential property sold as part of a subdivision in which the DRE public report is required, so five or more units. A licensee does not need to conduct a visual inspection for a unit in a new subdivision in which a public report is not required because it's a subdivision of improved single family homes. And despite the fact that this law limits the real estate licensee's inspection duty to one to four units, it is important to keep in mind that under agency law, a licensee's fiduciary duty to his or her buyer may require the licensee to denote red flags, even in a residential five or more unit uh, or other types of properties. Uh, so what types of transactions are covered by this law? Sales, leases with options to purchase, ground leases of land in which one to four dwelling units have been constructed, uh, real property sales. Do real estate licensees have to conduct an inspection in as-is sales? Uh, there is no exemption in law for this kind of transaction. While a seller may effectively limit his or her liability as far as not warranting the condition of the property, the licensee must still conduct a reasonably competent and diligent visual inspection with the appropriate disclosures to the buyer. Uh, what is the real estate licensee standard of care that the law imposes? A real estate licensee must use the degree of care that a reasonably prudent real estate licensee would exercise and is measured by the degree of knowledge through education, experience, and examination required to obtain a real estate license. It's always, you know, reasonably. It always comes down to reasonably, you know, <laughs> right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, in, a, in a court of law, it's always, they come back to, you know, did you use reasonable, you know, care? <laughs> that, that's a cover their ass uh, statement, if you have, ask me. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Always, right? <laughs> I mean, you might be able to get a real estate license, but I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, when I was newly licensed 20 years ago, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no nope. clue. Nope. It happens. And that's why it's good to have a mentor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, does licensee have a duty to inspect inaccessible areas? So the required inspection does not include or involve an inspection of areas that are reasonably and normally inaccessible. You mean I don't have to go underneath that uh, raised foundation, Travis, with my suit on? Don't have to go under the raised foundation. <laughs> we don't have to climb up hillsides. We don't have to go onto a roof or an attic. Uh, we don't have to move or look under or behind furniture. Uh, we don't have to look in the cabinets or lock the doors. So, you know, this is a... Uh, Visual inspection. We're not moving furniture and things like that and crawling under houses. Good. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that goes beyond our scope of duty. It does. So what about transactions where the property includes common areas such as uh, the sale of a condominium? So the law specifically states that the duty only applies to the unit offered for sale and not to common areas or other units. As long as a buyer is provided with the information about the subdivision property that is already required by law. So that means you're not inspecting the, uh, the common pool in a, in, a, in a condo. Yeah, that would not be. Uh, yeah, the or the gym or, you know, parking garage, <laughs> right. stuff like that. So uh, is a license required to inspect property that is part of residential and part commercial, such as a farm with a house on it or a mixed use building? Yes, but only the residential part. So the licensee is required to do a reasonably diligent visual inspection of the residence, but not the commercial part, such as farmland or an adjoining store or restaurant. 
So you don't have to go out and, in, and inspect the barn. You don't have to. In, nope. <laughs> or the cornfields. Right. Okay. Good. <laughs> so basically, if you have um, it, some areas have them, we have them where I live, uh, especially over like Hanalejo Hills, and some of these new developments going in that are coastal. They're mixed use, and they have a condo on the top, and then part of that purchase would also be storefront down below, you would not have to inspect the storefront down below, just the apartment up top. Not down here. Yep. <laughs> uh, must the licensee disclose material facts personally known by the real estate licensee to a buyer? This law does not alter the requirement that a licensee must disclose material facts that the licensee is aware of such as the existence of nuisances or defects or a lack of permits or other conditions that may affect the value or desirability of the property offered for sale by a, uh, to a buyer. However, the law also specifically states that nothing in this law relieves a buyer of the duty to exercise reasonable care to protect himself or herself, including those facts which are known to her or to or are within the diligent attention and observation of the buyer. In a transaction where both a listing and a selling agent are involved, which licensee must conduct the inspection? Oh. If both a selling and listing agent are involved in a transaction covered by this law, both licensees must conduct an inspection. The TDS provides space for both the listing and selling agents to state what their inspections have revealed, either form TDS when seller must provide the TDS or AVID when seller is exempt from providing TDS may be used. Yeah, and this is, this is pretty, this is good stuff right here. Yeah. Uh, what procedure should the licensee use to document this inspection when a seller is not required to provide a TDS, such as a probate or REO? Remember that the licensee's duty to conduct a competent and visual, uh, diligent visual inspection of the property and disclose any red flag indicators of potential problems to prospective buyers. This is a licensee's duty regardless of whether or not the seller is exempt from providing TDS. Even though in such transaction the TDS is not required, it would be prudent for the licensee to document the results of the inspection in writing and provide this to the buyer. So Travis, in that case, if you were representing the buyer and a in a probate or a uh, REO they're saying that the buyer's agent you should fill it out anyways and at least present that to your client uh, even if the other side doesn't want to sign it or they don't feel they have to sign it they just feel that you should do it regardless as a prudent uh, thing yeah, is that way we're reading that yeah because it's still your duty to inspect mm -hmm. so you would want to do that if it's residential one to four. I remember being in a transaction years and years ago where that was the case and, and we you know did our inspection and stuff and they, and the other side just refused to sign it. Right. We're not signing that. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But we went ahead and did it for our client anyways. You know what I mean? Yeah. You'll get that sometimes in REOs. I know that hasn't been a big thing lately, but um, some of those, you know, asset managers don't want to sign stuff. So, um, yeah, go ahead and do the, uh, do the inspection anyways. Yeah. Cause they don't want any attachment or any perceived liability on any level. Right. And they're just yep. like, Hey, we took the property back. We're selling it. We don't know anything about it. Yep. They, they do the what's required by law and that's it. Makes yep. sense. <laughs> yep. Bare minimum on those. Bare minimum. All right, should have a few more slides. All right, uh, what information should be included in this written report of the licensee's visual inspection? So what are we putting on it? Uh, generally, the report uh, to the buyer should include the following. Uh, dates of the visual inspection, uh, the results of the inspection, including any obvious red flags or defects, recommendations, for further inspections if warranted by appropriate professionals concerning the condition of the property. Uh, 
uh, how does an agent conduct a visual inspection? An agent should conduct a reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection of a property to disclose all facts materially affecting its value or desirability as such an inspection would reveal. Above all, the agent should identify red flags. This includes anything such as cracks, stains, discolorations, spots, peeling paint, popcorn ceiling, hillside netting, and even or, and uneven flooring or warping floors, etc., cetera, uh, to be disclosed. Right. Stick to the facts and do not speculate. For example, you may say green and black discoloration in bathroom number one. Uh, do not say mold of the toxic variety because you don't know if it's toxic. Uh, surface mold, you don't know how deeply it penetrates. Uh, easily cleaned, you don't know exactly what remediation effort is necessary. Uh, or caused by leak and caulking, uh, you're not offering an opinion as to cause. Yeah, that's so key. You just do not speculate on that stuff. Literally yeah. Just you know, show what you see, visually what you see, that's your job. Yep, just state facts. <laughs> right. Uh, it is better to not state mold at all. As an agent, you should not assume the role of an environmental toxicologist to make the determination whether the subject property contains mold or other hazards. No. Uh, do not guess at the adequacy of repairs. Uh, do not say repair work looks solid, appears to be up to code. Uh, stay away from loose language such as no problems whatsoever. Obviously, there could be uh, remodeled all over. Really, was it truly remodeled everywhere? Right. I mean, don't say these things. <laughs> yeah. Do not <laughs> attempt to use visual inspection for marketing or puppetry. The house is already sold. <laughs> I want to say I've seen all those along the along the road of my career in this business. <laughs> yeah, sure, for sure. Completely remodeled ten years ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> up, up, up to code, perceived that whatever it was, it was like yeah. up to code one. I've seen that one for sure. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Er, yeah. Jeez. Thanks. Thanks uh, for that. <laughs> do not quantify or describe defects. Uh, when identifying cracks, stains, paint damage, spots, etc., do not attempt to quantify or otherwise describe size, significance, or degree of a defect. Same thing uh, here. <laughs> for example, do not say hairline crack, small crack, severe crack. Uh, you certainly, or you can certainly be uh, specific by indicating the location of a material defect, such as crack near upper left corner of wall facing door. But don't be so specific that you're going beyond the scope of your expertise. Example, 3 sixteenths of an inch slope in entryway. Uh, lastly, the agent should not simply say, I agree with the seller's portion of the TDF, or make other remarks such as, I do not see anything which contradicts seller's statements. This type of statement allows creative plaintiff's attorneys to argue that the agent has endorsed and or adopted the seller's own negligent statement as their own. Right. Um, we always have to think about what's an attorney going to say, what's a judge going to say, you know. Well, and, there, and your uh, client might not end up being so loyal to you after they find out they're in a lawsuit, so. Uh, typically not. <laughs> they're probably going to pit you against each other and they're going to try to force uh, some sort of, well, who's got the liability? Well, more than likely, it's going to be the uh, uh, the buyer filing the lawsuit. And if you were representing the buyer, then obviously you did a bad job. So you're getting thrown under the bus too. And guess where the attorney's going? He's going where the where the coverage is and where the policy is and where the money is. Exactly. Uh, yep. Uh, when must a visual inspection be delivered to the buyer? for the seller's agent within seven days under default terms of the uh, car purchase agreement. For example, RPA under paragraph 10A2 ties delivery of the visual inspection, whether written on the third page of the TDS or in a separate AVID form to the seller's obligations to provide to the buyer fully completed disclosures. Failure to deliver visual inspection within the required timeframe uh, which is seven days by default, creates a contractual cancellation right under 10A6 and 7 of the RPA. Imperative to stick strictly to required timeframes for delivery. 
So here we have the RPA. And if you click one more time, Kevin. There we go. We have 10A2 and it says any statutory disclosure required by this paragraph is considered fully completed if seller has answered all questions and completed and signed seller's section and the seller's agent. If any has completed and signed seller's broker form, um, firm sections, or if applicable, any agent annual disclosure. Nothing stated here in a lease a buyer's broker form or firm, if any, from the obligation to conduct a reasonably competent and diligent visual inspection of the accessible areas of the property and disclose in section, um, what is that, four? Yeah. Six, yeah, of the TDS or AVID. Uh, material facts affecting the value or desirability of the property. So, I mean, follow the contract. That's when when agents contact me with questions, I usually say, what's the contract? Say is right. always the first words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's 10A7 as well. Um, if any disclosure or notice specified in 10A1 or subsequent or amended disclosure or notice is delivered to the buyer, after offer assigned, buyers shall have the right to cancel this agreement within three days or five days after delivery uh, by deposit in the mail or by electronic or satisfying, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, if you're providing this, uh, you know, you're, you're avid 15, 17, 20 days in, um, after contingencies have been released even, the buyer would still have time to review this and cancel because you didn't provide it in time and they still get time to Right. And I know we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, cruising through this, but if anybody has questions, make sure to ask them in the chat or even in the, uh, the question and answer section of the, uh, of the Zoom. Yeah. And, and then, of course, you know, if you have specific questions, you can, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. Call me afterwards if you want to talk privately. Bill? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, or if you have any anecdotal um situations what that might be of uh, help to any of our fellow agents we always appreciate appreciate that as well because um, you know unfortunately uh, for some of us who've been in the business a long time or or maybe even not that long we do find ourselves in situations that um, are good to share for sure and, and I can you know if you yeah if you have a, a microphone um, I can bring on any of you if you ever want to you know if you have something to say or something to uh, to, to contribute thanks Kev you're welcome, Bill. <laughs> All right. Is there a cancellation right associated with delivery of the visual inspection based upon statute? Whenever a TDS is required, then the statutory cancellation right adheres to completion and delivery of both TDS and listings or listing agents visual inspection. Even if a non-car purchase agreement was used in a transaction or even if the buyer had already removed all contingencies, the buyer would still retain a three or five day cancellation right based upon delivery of the visual inspection, separate and apart from what the contract stated. Um, one of our star agents, Ana Chavez, has a question. Uh, what if there's nothing to note? What's the proper verbiage? Um, if there's, well, I'm kind of a believer that there's always something. Find something. I, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cracked paint, chipping the, uh, you know, chipping a wall, chipping a baseboard, you know. There's got to be something to note on a, yeah. search it out. <laughs> and, and even in new, new home sales, I mean, I, I, I had a conversation once with a home inspector, and this is in a new home sale. One of them, I think it was like KB Homes or something. And he was like, I could even, I could find 20 things at least in these new homes that are either uh, have been done poorly or things that are just need to be noted. And wow. so, um you know, I think that, as Travis said, that's important. I think there is always something to know. Even stuff like, you know, um, uh, pinholes in the wall and like just, you know, really lame things like that. If it's a really good house, it, you got to have something in there. I agree. You'd be surprised on new homes what, what you find. I mean, if you actually do a home inspection on a new home, um, the home inspector usually finds stuff. Um, I've, I've had home inspectors on brand new homes find... Um, uh, fireplace flue pipes that weren't connected, um, bathtubs that weren't secured at the bottom, um, just like kind of some crazy stuff sometimes. And they're like, wow, that, that's 
Well, there's there's a, there's a statistic that backs that up, Travis. I think uh, at one point, well, the stat was this: eighty percent of all condo condo uh, communities end up in litigation of some sort. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> those builders are building stuff cheap and fast, and they're ripping through those things, and they cut corners. Don't kid yourself; oh. they cut they cut corners. So, uh, especially the conversions. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> those condo conversions, man. I mean, those always go into litigation. It seems. Yep. All right, Brad, there was one more. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, if no the problem. property is a residential one to four property, but is TDS exempt, then no statutory cancellation rate would attach to delivery of visual inspection, even though an agent might still be required to complete and deliver one. Would a buyer have a right to cancel based upon delivery of their own buyer's agent's visual inspection? Cancellation right is based upon the delivery of the listing agent's visual inspection. How many days does a buyer have to cancel under law after delivery of the visual inspection? Assuming the TDS or visual inspection is not delivered in advance, the execution of the purchase agreement, the buyer will still or will have three days to cancel if the listing agent's visual inspection is delivered in person or five days if delivered by either mail or electronically. Is the statutory cancellation based upon delivery of the visual inspection waivable by the buyer? This says the TDS cancellation right is not waivable, neither is the buyer's right to cancel based upon delivery of the visual inspection. Is there a statute of limitations for an alleged breach of this duty to inspect and disclose? A lawsuit alleging a breach of a licensee's duty under this law must be filed within two years from the date of occupancy, the date of recordation of the deed to the buyer, or the date of close of escrow, whichever occurs first. However, in Field versus Century 21, the court held that, uh, that the three-year statute of limitations controlled a buyer's suit for breach of fiduciary duty against an exclusive buyer's broker. And that concludes the presentation. Excellent. Um, so, of course, uh, if anybody has questions about this stuff, this is really important. So don't hesitate to ask. And uh, Bill, do you have any other takeaways from, from today's presentation? Uh, no, I think it's pretty straightforward. No, yeah. um, I mean, you know, material facts, disclosing, uh, AVID is so important, as Travis has mentioned, to keep yourself out of trouble and to prove that you are competent at your job. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. You know. I, I don't know how many AVIDs I see that just have nothing noted all the way down on everything. You know, there's something in the house. There always is. Yeah. So please just, you know, make your notes, cover your butt, cover our butt, you know, cover your buyer as well, and do the, the visual inspection, you know, as detailed as possible. And be consistent on every property as well. Yeah. Yeah, and especially for for you for you, for you agents that are doing are, are really busy. You guys carry multiple listings. You guys are, uh, you know, closing multiple transactions. Um, you know, it's just something to make sure you're on top of because uh, it's something that's easy to kind of be, eh, you know, something to blow through or just not take the extra, you know, few minutes just to to do it right. Um, this is definitely an exposure area. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're on the listing side, you know, pr provide that avid as soon as possible, you know, because you don't want to be the reason that a seller can't cancel later on if, if that becomes a thing. So if, if they've performed on their end with delivering all the, uh, the uh, disclosures and, and, and such and you haven't delivered yours, you know, you could be the reason holding up a, a potential cancellation that's needed. That is a really good point because now your, your, your client pointing the finger at you going, Hey buddy, uh, you didn't do your job and now this cost me my transaction <laughs> yeah. or cost me time to get it back on the market or whatever it is. Right, right. Don't be the bottleneck. Yeah. All right, great. Well, right. Uh, Travis, thank you so much for that. Bill, no thanks problem. for your insights as usual. Of course. All right, and agents, thank you for taking, you know, half an hour out of your week to learn about the business. Uh, today was great. So, uh, get back out there, make it a great day, make it a productive day, and we'll see you guys next week on the webinar. Bye-bye.